How far can we go as a species? What are the limits? And where do we look for creative and innovative solutions to solve current and future problems? My name's Ivan Schwab. I'm an ophthalmologist. That's a medical doctor who meets the needs of patients with medical and surgical eye problems. I have a long-standing interest in natural history and evolutionary biology. The combination of those interests led me to write a book on the evolution of eyes. And that research for that book has taught me that evolution is always relevant. It produces creative and innovative solutions with the material it has, often very elegant ones. Now, my interest is primarily sensory biology. So I'm going to talk about that. But the principles I discuss can be found in individual cells, in entire ecosystems, and in other animals. Let's look, for example, at woodpeckers. The woodpeckers pound their lives away. The pileated woodpecker may strike a tree up to 12,000 times a day at 15 miles an hour with deceleration forces of about 1,000 Gs. Now, you can only withstand about 150 Gs before you pass out. This is a little like you running into a wall at 15 miles an hour 12,000 times a day, face first. <laughs> so why don't woodpeckers get headaches? Why don't they get concussions or retinal detachments? Well, the answer lies in what evolutionary adaptations have been transferred to the woodpecker. You can see from this 3D reconstruction that the lower mandible, the lower beak of the woodpecker is much denser and longer than the upper one. So with each strike, that force is transmitted on the heavy lower bill to the heavy base of the skull and then into the powerful and robust muscles of the neck. There are many other adaptations, and I won't go through them all today, but you can certainly see that evolution has provided many good mechanisms to prevent this bird from having head injury. But we already knew that. We knew that they don't get concussions because the woods are not littered with dead and dying woodpeckers. <laughs> we even have evidence that woodpeckers don't get headaches because there'd be no more woodpeckers. Woodpeckers would vanish if the woodpeckers came home at night and said, sorry, honey, I've got a headache. <laughs> now, I mentioned current and future problems. Now, solving a future problem is a little like answering an anonymous letter or answering the question, we've sent your bags on ahead, where will you be staying? So I'm not looking for the individual answers in these animals, but rather the principles on how evolution solves problems. Let's look at a couple animals. Let's look at the jumping spider first. Now, this is a common animal. If you're a gardener, you know this creature well. It's positively charming in your backyard. And as you get close to this animal, you realize why. Very curious. And as it looks at you, it has this attentive child look. The reason is, is that the eyes are large for the body size. And as you move about from side to side, the animal will jump about to see you because those external eyes are fixed in its head. So it has to move. But at that distance, it sees almost as well as you do. Certainly the best or among the best in the arthropodian world. So how does it do it? Well, to figure that out, we need to look inside the eye. Those external lenses are attached to tubes, and at the base of that tube is a pit. That pit is lined with photoreceptors, and photoreceptors are the cells that do the seeing. The optics and really the anatomy of that pit creates uh, an element that will cause divergence of the light rays at that point. So that becomes a two-element Galilean telescope. So this animal is seeing the world through a telescope, but that's not enough because it's only a spot in the visual field. So how does it enlarge its visual field? Well, it does so by scanning. Scan a line, scan a line, scan a line, and move down with that scanning, and then transmit that information to the brain. 
the brain assembles it into a whole scene, very much like a raster scan on your TV or on your computer screen. But that's still not enough because this animal has color in its world and it has to see that color. In fact, it can see more colors than you do because it has an ultraviolet color receptor. It has four color receptors, you have three. So with such a tiny eye, how does it get that much color vision? And yet another evolutionary trick. Your color receptors are lined up side by side like row houses. But these are stacked like a skyscraper or like a tall building. So that each ray of light, as it comes into the eye, whatever its wavelength, whatever its color, is absorbed by the appropriate visual pigment, the appropriate cell. So the spider makes the best possible use of each light ray that enters that eye. Now, the other eyes on the head are not scanning eyes. They're used to enlarge the visual field to protect against predation or perhaps find dinner and have the animal turn to face a new prey. But you can see from this animal that evolution has created a creature that has taken minification to just a fine art. This animal has proven that size does matter. And it's pretty good. Well, if you do it right. Now, I want to move on to one more animal just to illustrate how evolution has come up with the right principle. Uh, it reminds me, I need to, to point out that we could use this spider eye for other purposes besides what the spider does. The spider can see these colors because of stacked photoreceptors. If you use this principle for a camera, uh, a camera sensor plate, you could overnight triple the density of that, that uh, camera plate. Well, you'd have to be able to apply the principle. It isn't done yet, but that's possible. Or maybe you can make a tiny projector for a tiny space, like in a spacecraft. Point is, this is an underutilized principle. Now, I want to show you one other animal with some underutilized principles, and that's the ever-popular shrimp. Now, the shrimp, the lobster, and a few others are part of a group known as the long-bodied decapods. These animals arose about 500 million years ago during the Cambrian. The Cambrian was a, a time of evolutionary experimentation and lots of animals evolved and later became extinct. But to escape the carnivory and predation of those shallow seas, some animals would go much deeper towards the abyss. And as it got darker, light became very precious and evolution had to find a way to capture more light. Well, the long-bodied decapods did just that. They developed square units in their eye. Now, you may know that a compound eye, which shrimp have, flies have, wasps have, is made up of many units. And those units are called omatidia. It's Greek. It means little eyes. It has omatidia just like a fly or a wasp, but the wasp will have hexagonal omatidia, whereas this creature has square ones. Why the difference? Why sacrifice that hexagonal patterning? Well, the answer lies also in the creature's eye because these eyes are lensless. There are no lenses, but these are mirror boxes. Okay, now, what's a mirror box and what's the concept behind a mirror box? When you go to get fit for a suit or a dress, you'll step onto a platform and there'll be three mirrors perpendicular to each other. You can see yourself in one mirror, but you can also see yourself in that same mirror in the other two mirrors. Now, close that fourth side off and bring that down to a taper, to a point. And you have a light collecting system that will amplify the light to a single point on the retina. This is, in effect, a telescope or, if you like, uh, a microscope. And here is an electron microscopic image of that tapering effect. Now, in life, those tails would be straight and intact, but the fracturing method for the image uh, unfortunately caused them to curve, but I bet they'd still work. So this principle, this mirror box principle, is so valuable that right now there's a lobster eye telescope circling the globe. It's used to look at x-rays. And why? Because x-rays cannot be refracted or bent by conventional lenses, but they can be reflected. Which means you can use this telescope to study X-ray emissions of the rim around a black hole. 
because black holes don't emit light, but the x-rays around the rim are the way to study it. And this is being done right now in this lobster eye telescope. And you probably thought that lobsters were only good for an evening dinner, white wine, drawn butter, and a hot date. But they have another use. You might be able to use this for a handheld microscope to look in small areas like circuit boards. You might use this principle in an intraocular lens to put inside patients' eyes who have eye problems. You might be able to direct this image away from an area of damaged retina and have it be a telescope at the same time. It would be very light and easy to implant. Use your imagination on how this principle might be used otherwise. So I think you can see that evolution always produces relevant solutions, creative, innovative, elegant solutions, always to the creature's niche and with the tools available to it. But overriding principle is this. There are no preconceived notions. There are no rules. Evolution may work very slowly, although sometimes it works fast. But there's no preconceived restrictions evolution puts on itself. So my biggest conclusion to all of us is that there is no box to think out of. There is no envelope to push. And there's really only one finish line, and neither you nor I nor our species is there yet. So the limits are really only our dreams and our imaginations. These are my credits, and thank you very much.